Hi and welcome to this A2 revision webcast covering aspects of one of my favourite topics, I'm sure it's one of your favourite uh, subjects as well, the balance of payments, the old BOP. Can I just start with a little bit of context for you A2 economics uh, students? I think it's really important to understand the balance of payments in the context of what else is happening in the world economy. So when you're revising this topic, the balance of payments, please revise it at the same time as you look at the exchange rate, for example, at the same time as you look at your notes on competitiveness, supply side policies, all that kind of stuff. Crucially, please revise this topic when you're looking at globalization because you can't divorce the, the trends in trade and investment income and demand for goods and services around the world from, from the wider sort of globalization aspects. Here are just half a dozen, what I think, important aspects of globalization. First of all, for most countries, the ratio of trade to GDP pretty much rises every year. Not, not every year, but most years, the, the, the trade becomes more important. Either trade between regions, uh, between economic entities, so for example, the European Union, or increasingly trade within regions within ASEAN, within East African Economic Community, within the European Union, within Mercosur. Intra-regional trade is becoming really important. And put that in context, the, the balance of payments oftentimes is the result of quite significant trade flows and patterns of trade changing within countries. We also live in a world where financial capital uh, moves at a frighteningly rapid pace. Um, money flowing into bank accounts, into equities, into housing, into government bonds, all that kind of stuff. So the balance of payments is, a, is a partly a, re a reflection of what is happening to these huge capital flows. The link to that is the, the continued growth of investment, foreign direct investment, and big multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Barely a day goes by without some major new kind of bid or, or corporate mating taking place. What uh, those two middle graphics in the top slide tell you is that there's a huge amount of capital flowing around the world economy and the balance of payments that you study at A2 level has to understand capital flows. And we'll come back to those in just a few seconds. Other aspects are the rise of truly global brands. Uh, you know, the Googles, the McDonalds and the Coca-Colas of, of this world. Astronomically successful in many ways. And also the rise of global brands from emerging in developing countries like Alibaba in China, or China Mobile. Linked to all of this, this is still a kind of prelude to the balance of payments, is that increasingly we, we see a deeper specialization of goods and services. And that, that is part of globalization, the breaking down of production. Uh, the iPhone coming, the component parts for the iPhone coming from many, many different countries. And linked to that is the, is the rise of truly global supply chains, bringing goods to market and the emergence of new trade and investment routes of which the new the Chinese Silk Road is just uh, just an example. So what I'm saying here is that the balance of payments, what we're going to cover in this revision webcast, has to be seen in the wider context of, of significant important changes in, in, the, in the global economy. Balance of payments, hopefully you've done some revision on it, it's uh, made up of three accounts. The current account is the one you would have covered at AS level. The capital account we'll talk through in a second, and something we also call the official financing account, the ways in which governments have to make sure their balance of payments balances. So for A2, you need to know all three. If you're taking AS exams, just the current account is all, all you need to cover in the revision. So here's the current account. This will look eerily familiar for those of you who revised the balance of payments last year. The current account is the sum of just four separate balances, the balance of trading goods, tangible uh, physical products such as oil and motor cars and uh, computers, the balance of trading services, healthcare, insurance, legal services, tourism, all that kind of stuff. And then we have the balance of net money transfers, including kind of remittance money flowing between countries, and also the balance of net investment income. This is the income that companies and individuals earn from their overseas investments, be it uh, the profits from a foreign subsidiary or the rental income from owning land and property in other countries. Now the current account 
current account of the balance of payments is best described by asking this question. If you look at a country's current account, is it basically paying its way in the international economy? Is it earning enough money exporting goods and services from the inflows of remittances, what have you, uh, and from the income from its assets overseas? Is it earning enough to pay for imports of goods and services uh, to cover the current account? Just going to work through very quickly. There seems to be a lot on this slide. There isn't if we just work through it quickly. A kind of stylized view of a balance of payments account. You probably won't be given this much detail in the exam. Mainly the data on current account with a bit of capital thrown in. But here's an example. Reading from the bottom, uh, reading from the top here, the current account. Let's take in this example a country which is running a trade deficit in goods, $25 billion. Trade surplus and services plus 10. Uh, net, invest, net investment income is negative. Maybe they've got some significant foreign investment and the profits are leaving the country. And they're, but they're positive on transfers. For example, they might be a country in net receipt of remittance income. Add one, two, three, and four together, you get the current account balance. If my maths is right, this country would be running a current account deficit, a net outflow on the circular flow of about $19 billion. And pretty much at AS level, that's what uh, would be the case, and uh, you, you move on to the economics of that. At A2, you have to be aware of the capital account as well. It's not just trading goods and services, it's also the big capital flows. So keep in mind, this country is running a current account deficit. Can it balance the books? Can it achieve a, a compensating capital account surplus to offset? Well, in this case, I've made the numbers up, but assuming they've attracted some net foreign investment, $5 billion, maybe they've attracted some money into their property markets or the, the bond and equity markets, plus six. I'm assuming a little bit of money leaves the banking system. You may have heard of something called hot money. I have chucked in a balancing item of plus two because that's the sort of person I am. It's there to reflect errors in emissions. Eventually, you end up with a figure of not enough to cover the minus 19. I think you end up with plus 11. And therefore, to make sure the balance of payments balances, you have to make an adjustment to the size of your gold and foreign currency reserves. Those reserves will be cut by $8 billion. That actually appears as a plus eight on the account. And the final effect is the balance of payments sums to zero. Every country's balance of payments does sum to zero. Okay? If you're at a dinner party or in a pub and somebody says, I think Britain's suffering from a major balance of payments deficit, the answer is no, we don't. We may have a current account deficit, but our balance of payments sums to zero. If a country is running a current account deficit, it has to attract a capital account surplus. And if not, reserves of gold and foreign currency are reduced so that the, so that the account balances. Key point, key takeaway point from this slide is that the current account is one half of the account. Goods and services trade account, if you like. The second part is the inflows and outflows of capital into the economy. Now I'm going to focus mainly to start with on the current account. And one of the key features of the world economy in recent times has been the, the rise a little bit recently in the fall of trade and balances across the world economy. Seeing more and more countries running significant surpluses in trade, and a whole number of countries running large persistent deficits in trade. And the phrase that's used, great phrase to use in A2, is the idea of trade imbalances. And with those trade imbalances comes the threat of a, of a resurgence of tariff and non-tariff barriers, in other words, known as protectionism. Here's the data, very colorful, showing the current account balances for certain countries and regions in the world, taken from the IMF's uh, recent World Economic uh, Outlook. Key thing here is to look at the green line in the United States. The, it's below zero. so it, most of the last decade, the United States was running sizable current account deficits. American became a debtor nation. Britain, too, was running a current account deficit. More of that in a second or two. On the other hand, we've got surplus countries. Japan's a good example there. Initially, Russia. Well, that may be changing shortly. Surplus countries in the Middle East. And, of course, the, the current account surplus in the People's Republic of China. The big story. 2008, 2009, was huge trade current account imbalances. You'll see that those imbalances have moderated a little bit. 
And that's quite reasonably good news because if we can get more balanced trade around the world economy, hopefully we'll get more equitable trade and there'll be less threat of, of protectionism. Now, this chart shows countries with current account surpluses. And I think going into the exam, it's a really good idea just to have a few examples in your notes of the sort of countries that year in, year out, run current account surpluses, net inflows into the circular flow. Singapore is right up there. Look how high that is up on the y-axis. It's taken from the IMS World Economic Outlook. As we speak, Singapore running a current account deficit of nearly 20% of GDP, astronomically high. And until recently, Norway wasn't pretty far behind. Norway has run a current account surplus in excess of 10% of GDP every year since the turn of millennium. Now that surplus is due to fall. See the dotted line, the yellow dotted line. That's due to decline in the, few, in the next few years. That has to be to do with the, sh the sharp fall in the price of, of oil. But obviously oil is a major oil exporter. And then we have Germany. Germany's current account is actually in deficit at the turn of the, turn of the century. But over the, the last 10, 15 years, Germany has increasingly built up current account surpluses of the order of 6, 7% of GDP. There's a lot of European countries who are arguing that Germany should be cutting its current account surplus by stimulating demand in its own economy and that that would help to kickstart the somewhat moribund European uh, economy, the Eurozone sector. Uh, China, uh, everybody's favourite country for current account surpluses, well yes, follow the blue line for China, they have run surpluses, but actually in recent years those surpluses have moderated and they're running pretty much an external surplus of about 3% of GDP. And back in the 80s, when I was learning economics, Japan was the big current account surplus country. Now it's actually running a deficit, small deficit in, in trade, but Japan's current account surplus is basically 2%. Anyway, there we have six countries that basically run big current account surpluses. What does that mean if they're running an external surplus? It means two, two things, really. One is there's going to be a strong net inflow of demand income into their circular flow. Those countries will tend to grow more quickly if they're running a surplus. But from our point of view, from the A2 course, if you're running a current account surplus, that allows you to run a deficit on your capital account. Current account surplus countries can effectively build up a stock of foreign exchange, dollars, gold reserves, whatever it is, and use that money to invest overseas. A really important point, I suppose, particularly with Norway and China, is that a lot of these countries have sovereign wealth funds. Funds established to utilize the money that's come in from overseas sales and investments to reinvest overseas. So there's a net inflow of currency, and they have the financial resources to be able to invest overseas. Put at the bottom here that current account surplus countries tend to have strong exchange rates. That's because there's a net inflow of demand for their currency that tends, other things being the same, to push their, their currencies higher. Here's an example of a sovereign wealth fund. Norway's pension, government pension fund is the biggest in the world. It has over $800 billion worth of assets. And this was a sovereign wealth fund uh, that was created uh, 25 years ago now. And it comes highest, by the way, in terms of transparency, in terms of how that money is, is used. Uh, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority is pretty, pretty huge. That's now second. Saudi is a third. And there are two Chinese sovereign wealth funds that are in the top five in the world, including CIC, uh, doesn't score quite as well on transparency. Takeaway point from this slide is that current account surplus countries, Abu Dhabi, Norway, Saudi, China, Kuwait, they can run, operate significant sovereign wealth funds to reinvest in hopefully high performing assets in their own countries and also overseas. However, not every country can run a surplus. Balance of payments in that sense is a zero sum game. And it's inevitable there are going to be countries that run current account deficits as well. And a key point 
about this is that current account deficits themselves are not necessarily a major problem. But if the deficit is huge as a share of the GDP, and if a country is unable to attract capital, inflows of capital into their economy on the capital account, then the balance of payments has to balance, and the effect is that the foreign exchange reserves of a country tend to diminish or dwindle. Could be the case that a country with a severe external deficit that is unable to attract capital from foreign investors, or they'll have to go to an institution such as the IMF, or maybe an external source of funding from one of the BRIC countries, and get some emergency funding. And the crucial point is that countries that uh, are running current account deficits, they're going to accumulate external debts, which ultimately are going to be pretty hard to repay. I showed you a, sh a slide a few seconds ago of surplus countries. Here are some countries in a different situation. So these are current account deficits. Spain is interesting. Spain is the light blue line. Now, Spain, if you go to 2006, 2007, Spain was running enormous current account deficits. Down here, down in 2006, 2007, running deficits of nearly 10% of GDP. It was a basket case economy. Since then, deep recession and some supply side reforms uh, has caused the Spanish balance of payments to improve significantly. So although Spain has very high unemployment, it actually has improved its balance of payments quite sharply. And of course, the two are linked because persistently high rates of unemployment is going to damage consumer incomes and confidence and cause a fall in imports. Now look at the UK. The UK is in green. okay, And we've ebbed and flowed along the way. Basically, our current account is negative. And look at the dotted line here into 2013, 2014. Our current account has been rising. As you go into the exam, Britain last year ran a current account deficit of 5% of GDP, the highest for nearly 30 years. Forecast says it will improve, but we're not forecast to be in surplus. And other countries, India, USA, Brazil, they're also current account deficit countries. Of course, in the States, the world's biggest economy, by some measures, the size of the deficit in dollar terms will be huge, even if it's a share of GDP, it's pretty small. And then down at the bottom of the chart, I picked out two fast-growing countries in Africa, Ethiopia and Kenya. Now, they are growing pretty quickly, but one of the big issues they have to face is that they're running significant external deficits in excess of 6% of their GDP. These are countries which, if they're not careful, can run up against severe balance of payments problems. What are those problems? This slide takes you through just a few of the examples of the difficulties that can come from countries that run big trade deficits. Some of these points were a little bit back to AS Macro. And that's no bad thing because you can bring that kind of stuff into your answer and get plenty of credit for it. So if a country is running a big trade deficit, clearly it must be the case. There's a net outflow of aggregate demand from the circuit flow, and that's going to dampen the rate of growth of GDP. Ultimately, countries that run big trade deficits, although in the short term they're importing goods and services, ultimately in the long term their living standards do decline because they're not exporting enough to generate the output and the incomes to pay, to pay for those imports. And if imports are rising as a share of GDP, there's going to be a threat to jobs in domestic-based industries, such as car making or textiles or what have you. Ultimately, that can cause higher levels of structural unemployment. Countries running big trade deficits also tend to see weak uh, currencies because there's a net outflow of, of money from their circular flow. And weak currencies themselves can cause cost push inflation. For example, they raise the cost of imported food, the raw materials, or the cost of imported technology. And as I hope I've made clear in this presentation so far, if a country is running a trade deficit and they can't attract capital, then they may well run short of essential foreign currency reserves. Fundamentally, though, I think the key point is that a country with a significant trade deficit, it probably represents a lack of competitiveness on the supply side. There must be something underlying their economic performance which is causing the trade position to worsen. The other aspect of big trade gaps is there's a risk that investors get nervous. They can get very nervous, take their money out of the banking system or equities or the, the bond markets. 
and that can lead to what's called capital flight. And it can, in certain circumstances, precipitate a, a true balance of payments crisis. So trade gaps are a problem. How many of you can't sleep at night because the UK is running a current account deficit of three, four, five percent of GDP? Occasionally, I wake up at the night, wake up in the middle of the night, worrying about it. Not, not too often. And the reason is because although the UK is running a current account deficit, it's actually quite easy for the UK. It's a modern economy with huge financial markets. It's quite straightforward to attract capital to finance the current account gap. London is a favourite venue for property investors. A lot of foreign direct investments come in right across the UK and that's helped improve the capital account. So what can we do? What can a country do that's running a trade current account deficit, for example? What can a nation do to try and correct its performance? Many, many different ways. And don't forget, you can always go through this presentation later again if you want to take uh, extra notes on this. But essentially, if a country wants to improve trade, you've got to improve it either in the short term or think about a slightly longer term dynamic, a longer term strategy. I'll go top left initially. The easiest short term way to reduce a trade deficit is to have a recession or some kind of expenditure reducing policy which ultimately squeezes real incomes and causes a fall in the demand for imports. And I think a good example of this is probably Spain. The Spanish trade deficit, current account deficit, has improved dramatically in the last three or four years. Not because their currency is depreciated, they're part of the euro, not necessarily because the Spanish economy has become fundamentally more competitive, but because they've been in a deep recession and consumption has fallen much more quickly than GDP. The demand for imports has fallen. That recession has brought down prices in many sectors and actually is now generating more income in, in from tourism and a, a kind of partial rebound in construction. So to reduce the deficit, cut, cut incomes. Of course, there's a cost. The cost is living standards go down and unemployment is at a conceivably untenable level. Second option, top right is to try and encourage expenditure switching, to try and encourage consumers, for example, to buy more domestically produced goods instead of overseas output. Many, many ways to do this, one of which is to have a, an exchange rate depreciation, or in some cases a devaluation. You could also use protectionist policies such as tariffs, but most countries have signed up to and committed to tariff reduction policies within the kind of regional and global context. The obvious example is an exchange rate depreciation. Third way is just to make the macro economy work better, to keep inflation down, to encourage inward investment into, into a country, to lift productivity and basically try and make your economy more competitive in terms of measured, for example, by unit labour costs. Um, so the bottom right bit of this slide is similar to that. Generic improvements in competitiveness. Try and make your country, businesses and industries and sectors within your nation more competitive generally to give yourselves new competitive advantages and from which rising exports can flow. One of the key aspects is just to be aware of the currency effect. Will a currency improve the trade balance? Take the example of the pound falling against the dollar. Well, it makes import prices rise into the UK, makes export prices to the States fall. So there's the price change. And if a price changes, the relative price move, that should cause change in demand. In theory, we'll buy fewer imports in the States and hopefully we'll sell more exports to the, U to the USA. And this should feed through eventually to more domestic output. It should help the trade deficit reduce. And in theory, it should create more jobs. So an exchange rate depreciation is, in, th in theory, a way of helping to resolve persistent large trade deficits. It should make a country more competitive and boost the export sector. However, you may well be familiar with the idea of the J-curve. The J-curve is the idea that a currency depreciation doesn't necessarily improve the trade balance straight away. While blue star is the moment when the currency depreciates, Initially, the trade deficit might actually get bigger following the depreciation. 
but then hopefully the trade balance improves over time. So that if a fall in the currency uh, leads to an improvement in trade in net terms, then we say there's been what's called a Marshall Lerner condition has been met, and an exchange rate depreciation has improved the trade balance. That is the so-called J-curve idea. In a nutshell, uh, depreciation of the currency worsens the trade balance in the short term, but hopefully if the Marshall Lerner condition is met, it improves the trade balance between 6, 12, 18 months later. Why do we get a J-curve effect? Lots of reasons. The main one is that the demand for exports is maybe price inelastic. It takes time for export prices falling to feed through to higher demand. Could be the case that exporters have limited supply capacity to meet the extra demand. We might also be committed to importing products, a given quantity of imports, and they just become more expensive and therefore we have to spend more on those, on those imports. It could also be the case if the exchange rate depreciates, we see a rise in wages as people try and compensate for the higher cost of living. All kinds of reasons for the J-curve effect. I would advise you not to draw the J-curve in this way. A lot of students do. We get some weird and wacky J-curves in the exam. This is uh, a very common J-curve, and it simply is wrong. Okay? Currency depreciation leads to fall in the trade balance. That's fine. But the idea that you go from huge deficit to dramatic surplus in a space in the blink of an eye is clearly nonsense. Britain has a current account deficit of 5% of GDP. If the pound fell 15, 25% against the dollar, against the euro, we would not see a return to surplus because the causes of the deficit are only partly to do with the exchange rate and they're more fundamentally to do with competitiveness. And this is what I want to finish with. My final comment is about improving competitiveness. There will be a separate webcast on the economics of competitiveness and what nations can do to become relatively more competitive in the global economy. I just wanted to share with you an absolutely fantastic slide that I came across just a couple of weeks ago, which captures for me many, many different aspects of competitiveness in a rather handy nutshell. If countries want to become more competitive, they can either try and focus on becoming more price competitive, in other words, try and bring down, for example, the unit labor cost of production or try and attract investment, which uh, can, is more cheap, more cheap to run and operate. They can lift the productivity of labor or capital. They can cut business taxes or they can cut carbon taxes or other indirect taxes. In other words, countries can either try and focus on price competitiveness. That might involve cutting wages, for example deflation in wages, very painful for some, for some countries in recent times. Or they can focus on trying to change their economies, to change the structure of their economies. So for example, moving away from primary product dependence towards higher value-added manufacturing, moving away from mass volume manufacturing towards premium price products, focusing more on non-price competitiveness instead of just cost. So countries can either change their structure, build new export sectors, or crucially, they can build capabilities. And if there's one word I'd like to take out of this presentation on the balance of payments, it's the word capability. Know-how, the ability to bring new products to market, to meet people's changing needs and wants, the ability of businesses to be dynamically efficient, to have the kind of skilled labor, and institutional frameworks and environmental uh, facilities and resources to be able to be successful in global, globally competitive markets. This is absolutely fundamental. And the countries with current account surpluses, unless they are the product of just a super high price of oil or gas or what have you, most of the countries with current account surpluses, including Germany, they have exceptional capability they have exceptional complexity in their economy. And the products they produce and sell to the world tend to be premium price products where the exchange rate is less important. There will be a separate webinar on competitiveness, but I think the takeaway point from this slide is that if you want to improve your trade balance overall, 
you have to become more competitive. Competitive is a relative concept, and fundamentally, it's about structure and capabilities. Something that the UK economy has to face and focus on, regardless of, of who wins the 2015 election. So this has been a revision webcast on aspects of the balance of payments. We have loads of resources on the website. Let's go to our G2 website. The new search engine is very powerful. There are lots of topics on balance of payments, on exchange rates. You can work your way through the notes. Check out our Twitter feed. Loads of ideas and revision hints as we examine the exam's approach. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you all again sometime soon.